Bernie Dernheim, artist, rapper, yogi, and a narco syndicalist witch doctor, aka artfully disheveled. That's my DJ name. Uh, here again with you and delivering synthesizer content to those who are into that sort of thing. I um, put on my synth nerd uniform just now for the purposes of delivering this synthesizer content to you. So I, pro I, I hope you appreciate the effort that I have made with my appearance, which brought to mind that alias of mine, that DJ alias of mine, Artfully Disheveled. Um, so, you know, if you ever see Artfully Disheveled out there on a, on a, on a poster, Make sure you get along to that gig because um, that's me spinning records artfully disheveled all right let's let's talk synthesizers today we're talking about synthesizers we're talking about the zero control of course the zero control the moog work shadow one and this device here the low frequency oscillator and one shot events by dip mod dip mod this is a, a boutique synth brand that um, really only does prototypes. That's all we do at Dipmod is build prototypes. We don't have, sell any of our instruments, but we build prototypes and um, we talk about our instruments on YouTube. That's, that's the model, that's the business model for Dipmod. It's not much of a business model. It doesn't really generate much business but it does allow us to spread interesting ideas about synthesis. And that, that's what it's all about. And I do also want to point out that uh, we're going to be exploring territory that is related to a concept that I'm developing here on the channel, which is obviously intricately connected to both my yoga practice and to the practice of witch doctoring. And that is the concept of synth mystical practice or synth mysticism um, and and so a synth mystic is someone who uses the synthesizer to explore the unknown and of course there is much territory to explore so uh let's continue with the patch i mean or, or begin with the patch even we haven't begun really have we um just lots of talking so far um Okay, all right, let's 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 get started then. Uh, let's generate some sound from the Moog workstat. And let's start really simply. We're just going to start with the drone. Okay, just turn it on and have a drone at us. And I'm going to point out that this is not a static drone. This drone has been modulated by the LFO. It's running in to the VCO mod. You can see that's the switch indicating there, and it's modulating the PWM, the pulse width modulation. Um, uh, and you can see the rate of the LFO there. The first thing we're going to do is crank that up into the audio rates. And you can hear when we hit a tuning ratio, when we hit the appropriate tuning ratio, the beating will stop. It's just a little bit finicky to tune, hence the difficulties that I'm having here. There we go. And that's the nice thing about this technique is that once you've got the audio rate pulse width modulation happening it's quite unstable and hence the connection to synth mysticism the instability takes us into territory that we can only control up to a certain point as you saw with the difficulty that i was having in 
tuning the LFO to slow down the beating that occurs between the tuning of the LFO and the tuning of the main oscillator. We're going to get the zero control happening now. And the first thing we're going to do is simply take the dynamic gate and plug it into the gate in on the Moog workstat. And because we're using the envelope to control the VCF mod and the gate is triggering that envelope, we are now getting that VCF mod coming with the steps of the zero control. And this is before we e have even patched in any pitch information, which is of course the next thing that we will patch is the pitch. So this top row here is the pitch row and this is the output of that row. Need a longer patch cable there. Grab a green one. They are often the length that I seek. And so now we're going from the pitch information in to the VCO exponential in. Okay, so you can see uh, I patched this yesterday and it, I mean you'll notice that because the ratio between the notes that the sequencer is playing and these tunings here works for each of those notes but I, I want to point out that if I just hold hold down this note and adjust the tuning of that note you can hear that beating that occurs when the note is kind of out of tune with the LFO that is modulating the pulse width modulation at audio rates. So, and by holding those notes, we can find these nice, nice points of tuning. And, and basically, I've done that for every single note in this sequence. A synth mystic isn't someone who's just trying to write a fat bass line um, on a synth. I mean, that might involve some degree of mysticism. However, a true synth mystic is someone who isn't thinking in utilitarian terms about their synthesizer creation. It's someone who is really just using the instrument, as I said, as a vehicle for exploring the unknown. And the unknown, not just in terms of unknown sounds, sounds that the synthesis hasn't heard before uh, because we can also use that instrument to explore the unknown in terms of how the synthesizer connects us to the life around us, right? The tree blowing in the breeze, how the synthesizer can connect us to the sounds of cicadas to pick an obvious example because they're kind of already synthesizers aren't they cicadas so you know we can definitely connect to the sounds of cicadas through synthesizers but also we might connect to other life forms the bats and of course i'm speaking to you today from the soundside academy and you'll notice on the logo of the Soundside Academy, we have a bat. So if you think about echolocation, think about bat echolocation. Bats come to know their environment through sound, right? So in the same way, us humans can use synthesizers to come to know our environments through sound, similar to the bats. That's one of the forms of synth mysticism is a means for us to connect to the places in which we live and um, and this occurs in a number of different ways it occurs through the very process of synthesis as we're creating patches we can attune ourselves to our surroundings like again the example of the wind blowing through the leaves which is happening right outside my window here and is frequently happening in this studio that there is a tree right in front of 
the window and therefore I am frequently seeing that those leaves move with the breeze and hearing those sounds and that is coming in to certain aesthetic decisions that I'm making within this patch. So that's a form of synth mysticism that is connecting me to my immediate surroundings as I bring in noise sources. Perhaps that might be a reminiscent of those sounds of the wind blowing through the leaves. They are sounds that bring me a good deal of peace in this place. So they are kind of sounds that I would like to incorporate in some of the compositions that I'm making. Um, so that's, a, that's another form of synth mysticism. Now, let's take one more patch cable and plug it in to the dynamic envelope and we're going to take that and plug it into the VCA on the workstation. And so now we trigger the VCO with the envelope, we trigger the dynamic gate with the dynamic gate signal coming out of the zero control. And we have the clock running internally. So this timing that you're hearing is being determined by the time knob, the settings on this time knob here, and the speed of the sequence. Um, if I stop this sequence, we'll notice that we're still droning. So let's turn off the drone now. Start the sequence again. This is a very simple patch, three patch cables running from the zero control into the Moogwerk Shadow 01. And yet, there's a great deal of timbral complexity happening here. It's coming from the audio, audio rate pulse width modulation and the fact that we're tuning each of our notes to an interesting ratio of that audio rate pulse width modulation that's coming here. One of the traps of synthesizer mysticism is that the notion that it gets more mystical the more patch cables you add. I don't think that that is true. I think we can find mystical experiences with our synthesizers with relatively few patch cables. And there's another, there's another colliery, corollary. I believe is the word I'm looking for here, but I could be wrong. There's another, there's another corollary of that fact, which is that you should keep patching until you run out of, until you run out of patch cables. Like just keep jamming them into all of the holes. And again, I don't think that's necessary. I mean, sometimes it's appropriate to just patch away until you've used all your cables. But I think at a certain point you may you may just be patching for very little gain or you might be losing something as well. So today it's a relatively simple patch and yet it has undeniable ingredients of synth mysticism. So our next step then is going to be to bring a little bit of uncertainty to the timing of this sequence. So first, let's simply uh, plug in an external clock because that is our starting point. This is, this is just the square wave output from this LFO. So I'll turn off the internal clock. Turn on the LFO. So these are just basic square wave pulses coming out of the low frequency oscillator, clocking the zero control. Of course, once we have the zero control clocked externally, we can use the speed knob 
to change the length of the notes. And we can use the time knob to make those notes all equal length or to have different lengths as we did based on the settings of these knobs. Okay, still pretty straightforward, still a simple, pa simple patch. In fact, simpler than it was when I wasn't clocking externally because we've lost our modulation of time. So let's now bring back that modulation of time and let's do so with the external clock so that we can maintain these controls over the length of the note and the envelope that we're getting out of the zero control by using the speed knob and the time knob. So we want to take this time row out of the zero control and I'm going to plug it into this little guy here. This is part of the what I'm calling the less than zero control because it allows us to go into territory where we have a little less control. And um, we do that here by making a mix of two different CV signals. I'm just going to... So that's what this is. This is a straight CV mixer between two signals and there's your the CV crossfader if you like. It's actually a passive device. It's just a, just a potentiometer um, wired with the inputs to either side. So that's the time row coming out of the zero control into here. I'm normaling the CV mixer into the attenuverter and then this is the output from the attenuverter and we can take this output from the attenuverter and plug it into the frequency in on the LFO and now we're modulating the time of the LFO clock with these knobs down the bottom here with those time row of knobs along the bottom here and let's maybe just bring up the speed of that clock a little bit If I plug the values from the time road straight in to the frequency col control here, it's going to speed up when I would expect it to slow down based on these settings because this value here where you see a time knob that is turned all the way clockwise is effectively giving us 5 volts and when you have a time knob all the way counterclockwise that gives us 0 volts which means it's not going to change the time at all when the knobs are turned all the way down and it's going to speed things up a lot when the knobs are turned all the way up. We want the reverse of that because that's the way these knobs function on the zero control. So we need to go through the attenuverter. That's what we're doing here. You'll see I can flip that attenuversion. And that's a way to generate a differently timed sequence. And in fact, we can just surf through those values until we find something we like. So this is one way of manipulating the timing of the sequence is with the attenuverter itself. So we've got a crossfader here that's running into the attenuverter and there's nothing plugged into the other side of that. So I'm going to use some random voltages to further mess with the timing of this sequence. Now at this point we're getting no influence from the random voltages because our crossfader is turned toward this input here. As I turn it clockwise we get some influence from that random voltage. And we've got another means to control the speed of this sequence. We can also use the synthesizer 
to communicate more directly with the plants. Now, I have some ideas about how that might function. I'm not thinking about hooking electrodes up to plants because, you know, many people have done that. The, the process, you know, and I will describe briefly, is to take the, those kind of, amplify those electrical signals that are running through the plants and to sonify them in some way, to mm, turn them into some MIDI notes and maybe to quantize those MIDI notes, to make them a little bit more musical. And so there's these several degrees of abstraction in taking that data and turning it into musical form. And it's those degrees of abstraction that I find a little problematic. So I'm actually looking for ways to connect more directly to the plant in a way that might be meaningful to it as much as it is meaningful to me. And so the plan that I'm hatching is related to the use of accelerometers. And I'm, I'm putting this out there. I'm putting this out there. This is an idea. Some other people may be thinking along similar lines. I don't mind if you take this idea and run with it. I'm generous in that respect. I put ideas out there. You, if you hear them, if you want to credit me with that idea, that's great. I appreciate that. If you don't, well then whatever, whatever. We'll just pretend like you didn't see this video and you thought of it yourself. That's fine too. Um, so anyway, the idea is to use accelerometers attached to the plants and to then use that ex the voltages being produced by those accelerometers to modulate a synthesizer system. Now, I happen to have a, an accelerometer module that produces voltages, straight up voltages, uh, in the zero to three volts range, which is not a bad range when you're plugging it into a filter. Uh, it's not the full range of an LFO that might go from z minus 5 to plus 5 volts. It's just a 0 to 3 volt range. But we can work with that. And so the idea is to attach the accelerometer to the limbs of the plant and to then use that accelerometer to modulate, say, the filter of, 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 of a synthesizer and to play those sounds back into the space in which the plant is sitting. And in fact, it's more likely to be outside, although I might, may also attempt this in my studio and do use fans or something, you know, to move the plants or you move the plants in some other way. Um, now, the reason why I think this will be a, a, a more direct and perhaps meaningful sound to the plant is because the sound will correspond to the movement that the plant is experiencing and so I think there is some potential there for the plant to enter into a consciousness of that correspondence between the movement of its limb and the sounds issuing forth from the speakers. So Again, another form of synth mysticism here, this time using synthesizers to connect to plants and to speculate on the consciousness of the plant in this scenario. And this is where we take the zero control into sub-zero territory, the less than zero control. We take the time row, we mix in a little bit of random voltage, we send out that value to modulate an LFO, which we then use to clock the zero control. That circuit that we built with patch cables is taking us into the sub-zero territory, where we have less control over this device, and we're in something, some, a somewhat more mystical relationship with the synthesizer. But of course, there's more we can do here. There's always more we can do with synthesizers. But there's, there's more we can explore with this process of clocking externally. And that has to do with the features of this particular module. And in order to explain that, 
I want to bring up for you on the screen um, the data sheet for the chip around which this module is built, um, so that you can see, uh, so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about with the waveforms. So currently, we're using this waveform, the regular pulse, the square wave, and we're using it to clock this sequence. We're modulating the time of that square wave in order to clock this sequence. And we can use really any of these waveforms as a clock source for the zero control. And they all behave a little bit differently, a little bit differently depending on the settings of the, the TAP LFO module. Um, so, but this is where things get really interesting is the alternate wave set. So let's just go ahead and jump through some of these different waves. We'll start with the oct. Oh, sorry, before we get there, I'm just flipping over to the ramp up and, and that was the sounds that you were hearing. And you can hear the difference between ramp up and pulks is negligible or there is no difference. Um, but you will hear a difference when we flip to to when we flip the switch to the alternate wave set. What you're going to hear is ramp plus oct, and um, we'll hear how that changes the sequence. Let's let's flip that switch. So we're going ramp plus oct. So basically, we're just doubling the speed of the sequence um, with RAM plus OCT. The next position on the dial is the quad ramp. And this will be a little bit different to, to, to what we're currently hearing. So here we go, quad ramp. Now, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense immediately because it's making the sequence go a little too fast to be discernible. So we need to bring down the frequency on the LFO. So that's the quad ramp. Now would be a good time to introduce the distort, the wave distort functionality. So this is the wave distort. This is the way that it's described in the TAP LFO data sheet. The selected wave can be distorted using the wave distort input. This modifies the duty cycle of all LFO waveforms. Examples are shown below. The top row shows the effect of wave distort CV on the sine wave. So basically you're pushing the peak around in time um, it, it, you're pushing or one half of the peak around in time um, in relation to the other half and you can see similar things happening there in relation to the ramp down and the triangle. So the wave distort, you've got an idea about what that does but what does it sound like when it's plugged into a sequence like this? Let's just turn that wave distort. So in this case, with the quad ramp, we get a whole other set of rhythms in our clocking of the zero control. And it's kind of like a swing knob on steroids. I mean, it goes well beyond what swing will give you. turn it in the other direction counterclockwise tends to be less usable um, you can only really go so far and then it just kind of smears the notes together like that so you know keep it keep it keep it after 3 p.m. and um, yeah you might find some cool stuff there so that's that's the ramp that's the quad ramp let's let's have a look at some of these other waveforms the next one along is the quad pulse so see if that makes any difference at all so i'm just jumping up to check that we are on the quad pulse and indeed we are so 
I think you know this is this is interesting, isn't it? You know, like you wouldn't think there'd be that much difference between quad pulks and quad ramp, but clearly, under the influence of the wave distort, that is certainly true. There's some deeper differences going on there. And wave distort is a kind of pulse width modulation for those waveforms. It's changing the pulse width and therefore changing where those clock signals fall for the zero control. And as it changes where those clock signals fall, we get a change in the sequence. This is very pleasing to me. I don't know about you, but I find this very pleasing to have this range of rhythms available via a single knob. Okay, so what's next on the dial? Let's jump back in here. Next on the dial, this is quad pulse. Next we've got tri-step. This is our tri-step. Our tri-step. <laughs> we need a little bit more, um, a little bit more speed on this sequence, I think, with the tri-step. There's your tri-step. Let's do some wave distorting of that tri-step. Nothing. Nothing. Does nothing. The wave distort with the tri-step does absolutely nothing. So there's a tip for you. Something I, I, look, this is the first time I'm systematically going through each of these waveforms to see what happens. So I've just discovered something. The wave distort with the tri-step does nothing. Okay, what's next? What's next on the dial? Next up, we have the sine plus oct. Sine plus oct is most likely going to be similar to ramp plus oct. Let's see if that's true. Yeah, that's true. Basically, we've just got even steps until, of course, we turn the wave distort. And then you just get this nice lilting sequence. So this is where things will get different because wave distort is doing something that is dependent on those different wave shapes. So a sine plus oct with wave distort is going to do something different to ramp plus oct with wave distort. And look, what do you know? I mean, uh, we should, I should <laughs> jump back to, to the overhead. Um, I got a little carried away there looking at the sine plus oct with wave distort because, you know, in this case, all the way counterclockwise on the wave distort still gives us something interesting. So it really does depend on the waveform. I mean, come on, shit is lush. I find this so pleasing. This is, see, I, I'm currently working on a project with my collaborator, Ben Denham, musical project. The alias is Handmade Machine. And the premise of Handmade Machine is exactly this type of sequence. It's like just these slightly broken, lilting rhythms uh, that give us some indication that there is a hand 
somewhere in there that it's not all machine and so this is like just for handmade machine this is the this is the shit this is really the shit if you can just find these different rhythms with the turn of a knob I mean come on come on that shit is that shit is nice all right okay so let's let's see what's next on the wave distort menu <laughs> the wave distort taster menu uh, so we're going sine plus third next we're going sine plus third sine plus fourth so let's just go go to those sine plus third and and sine plus fourth sine plus third plus third. I'm going to jump into our distort trick here. Oh yeah. It's also worth pointing out why shit is a little bit wonky here because we're still getting some influence from these knobs, right? The cycle of the waveform is going to complete, but we're still getting modulation of the overall frequency. So depending on where things land, particularly when we're dealing with divisions, unequal divisions of the eight steps, we're going to get some interesting modulation because it's going to wait a little bit longer before reinitiating that cycle, depending on where it lands within the eight steps. Although now it seems to have settled down and we're getting a very consistent rhythm. See, that's, these are the aspects of synth mysticism that, that are truly intriguing. You have these pulses of voltage flowing through your system and they seem to be in a pattern of change and then they settle into a more regular repeating rhythm and I've had that occur on a number of different occasions so just like the equalization of those voltages takes a little while of course there there are those dimensions to synth mysticism where you simply create a patch that is sufficiently con complex sufficiently complex and perhaps organic that it feels alive it feels very much like a living entity and that's something that i think we've all experienced you know as explorers in the synth mystic domain i think we've all had that experience where we suddenly turn on the synthesizer and we convince ourselves that what is issuing forth is some kind of alien intelligence. I know I've certainly been there. You know, maybe having eaten certain psychedelic substances, we are perhaps more prone to such, such suggestions issuing forth from our synthesizers. And of course, eh, aficionados of both psychedelics and synthesizers will no doubt get the reference in the branding dip mod yes you know what i'm talking about or you don't and in which case you will at some point if you're interested in synthesizers having convinced myself that an alien intelligence was communicating with me through my synthesizer and having later realized that perhaps that may not be have been the case i still do not judge myself for having entered into such conclusions that an alien intelligence is issuing forth from my synthesizer. Because I think that sense that, that an external intelligence was coming from my synthesizer or, or speaking through my synthesizer 
is one that allowed me to more deeply engage with the patch. Sign plus four. bring it back to something I don't think we'll go with sign plus third I did like that before we add a few other elements to this patch bring it back to sign plus third now the missing elements of the patch are a form of modulation of that distort parameter I've been turning that knob by hand there but we can of course use another voltage to do that knob turning for us and in this case, we're going to use, sure, why not? Let's use some random voltages to do that knob turning. Uh, so let's grab a source of random voltage from this module over here off screen and plug it into the wave distort parameter. to convince yourself that an alien intelligence is communicating through your synthesizer and I'm and you know look as I said this I'm, I don't pretend that this is something that is unique to me I know many synthesis have experienced that where you where you believe that an alien intelligence is is speaking to you through your synthesizer so you know I know it's a common experience and, and I, what I'm urging us all to do as mystical synthesis is not to judge ourselves for having entered into such conclusions. Um, you know, when we are perhaps a little more sober in our judgment, not to, not to be too judgmental of the, the psychedelic self that came to that conclusion because it was a conclusion that allowed for a heightened engagement with our instruments and that's what we're all aspiring to aspiring to i think particularly synth mystics we're aspiring to this heightened form of engagement with synthesis and um and and there are many paths to get there there are many ways of, of finding that heightened form of engagement with our instrument the beautiful thing about this is that we're modulating the position of those nodes. We're not actually modulating tempo. Tempo is fixed, but the position of those nodes within that tempo grid is being modulated by the wave distort function. Bring a bit more of that random voltage back in. Okay. Let's use the, that random voltage a few other places. This time we're going to go into the zero control. We're going to take random voltage and plug it in 
to the direction input. So now we've got random voltage randomly changing the direction of our sequence. And let's take just a, a, a drizzle of that random voltage. So in this case, I'm going to run the random voltage through an attenuator. That's what we've got there on the top left hand side of the screen. I'm going to take that random voltage through an attenuator and we're going to plug it into the stop input on the zero control just so that we'll get some random pausing of the sequence on certain notes and i'm running it through the attenuator because if that happens too frequently it's not exactly what i'm desiring so i'm just going to dial it in until i get those first few stops of the sequence on a particular note. It's gradually bringing up the attenuator in order to achieve that. There we go. Somewhere right about there. A little bit less. Yeah, I think I think we're we're getting close now. Maybe a little less. We just want that stop to happen once in a while. I think we're there now. And we're gonna take a final copy of that random voltage and use it on another destination. I realize I'm now patching in a way that maybe you think could go on forever and maybe I'm going to go against everything I said in the introduction and patch until I run out of patch cables. But I can assure you that that's not the case. In fact, I think this may well be our last patch cable and we're just gonna take random voltage into the reset. Now, for me, this note here is the start of our sequence. So I'm gonna to touch that pad and that will ensure that when we get the reset, it will reset back to that particular pad. So this note is gonna occur more frequently than any other note in the sequence because any time that random voltage is over a certain threshold to trigger the reset, it will go back to that pad. I think all that's left to do is just have a little bit of a knob turning exercise with the speed control. Now you hear that as I decrease the speed, we've now got more time for that VCF mod of the envelope to take effect because the gates that are coming out of the zero control are a little bit longer so that can modulate the Moog Workstat via the VCF mod uh, with those longer gates that are closing down that cutoff frequency of the VCF
making that slight adjustment to the attack parameter of the envelope on the Moog Workstat. Because that attack is determining how quickly the cutoff frequency is pulled down by the envelope, it also affects our perception of the volume that's going to the VCA, given these plucky envelopes that are coming out of the zero control. So I'm just allowing a little bit of time for that plucky envelope to sneak through before the envelope of the Moog Workstat closes down the cutoff frequency. Get that initial burst of pluckiness before it closes down. That's what's happening. Let's shorten the decay time here on the Workstat. So with a shorter decay, we're hearing more of that pluckiness because every time that next note is, is triggered, there's the envelope has already dissipated, has decayed. And so we're not getting the cumulative effect of the envelope from those gates. Let's bring that back up again. Have a bit of a play with the time knob here. So as I turn the time attenuator down, we are getting a shift by which the longer notes are getting shorter. Shorter notes are sure the shortest notes are staying more or less the same length. The longer notes are getting shorter. Bring that back up. Those no longer notes now. Getting longer again. And let's have a look, finally, at the strength knob. How, that, how we can use that as a kind of global shaper of the sound as well. At a certain point, with the strength knob, I think we're going a bit over what the voltage is that the workstab is capable of responding to on that strength knob. So we're not noting, noticing as much difference in its upper reaches, but you, we will notice a difference as we bring the strength knob down now. So not only does the volume decrease, but we also are triggering less of that envelope on the Moog Workstat. This means that the VCF isn't, the VCF mod controlled by that envelope isn't closing down the cutoff frequency and therefore the filter is remaining more open. A brighter yet quieter sound. So another nice knob to be playing with, to twist in terms of shaping the sound. Let's bring it back up again. Bring in some of those lower frequencies that come with the sweeping of the cutoff downwards and the resonance that comes with those lower frequencies. Quick white 
evidence check. I think I think our lighting levels have changed somewhat since the beginning of this video. So just checking the white balance. So let's wrap this up. We've done some delving into the somewhat more mystical dimensions that it's possible for us to access with the zero control, particularly when we relinquish a bit of that control to other devices and when we use those devices to shape our sequence in various ways as we, as we are doing here with the low frequency oscillator and its wave distort function and of course that alternate wave set that gives us all of those funky waveforms such as the sine plus a third that is currently driving the sequence that we're hearing and then we bring in the random voltages to just mess with that sequence in different ways via the reset input, the stop input, and of course mixing a little bit of that random voltage with the timing of the time row of knobs. Um, all of these things contributing to the variation in the sequence that you're currently hearing. This is, in a nutshell, synth mysticism. It's setting up a system that has the, some of those characteristics of a living entity in its unpredictability. Here, I'm reminded of the cockatoos that fly outside this window that is in front of me. Cockatoos that clearly have a very different perception of our planet than us humans and have a delightful unpredictability. Uh, I mean, they're damn noisy too. I mean, if, if it was a little bit later in the day and they were flying past, you would no doubt hear them through the microphone that I'm currently speaking through. Very noisy creatures, but delightfully unpredictable. That's what makes them such a pleasure to watch outside the window, the way that they play in the trees, the way that they tear shit up, because that's like, why are you ripping up that tree? That's part of their unpredictability. And so when we're thinking about how the synthesizer, how we might patch the synthesizer as a kind of living entity, we're looking for some of that unpredictability in our patches. And perhaps at a certain point we become less concerned about whether or not what we're doing is music or musical and more concerned with a kind of truth, a true connection to the living entities that we patch on our synthesizers. So we might occasionally convince ourselves that we're hearing an alien intelligence coming through our synthesizers, but that is just a product of the passion and commitment of the synth mystic, determined to find the unknown through the synthesizer and open to the possibility that many different kinds of entities might be speaking to us through synth circuitry. It's that openness to the possibility of communication with unknown entities that really defines the synth mystic. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk today on synth mysticism. I hope you've enjoyed the patch as well. I hope it's inspired you to go out and patch for yourself. And to finish, I want to share the love of synthesizers with you and also share the love more generally. And we'll see you in the next one. Oh yeah, and look out for awfully dishevelled, awfully dishevelled, playing at a bar near you. <laughs> <laughs>